Dear ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the conference call of Moneta Money Bank regarding third quarter 2024 financial results. Please note that this conference call will be recorded. This event will have a live presentation followed by a Q&A session. As a reminder, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. Today's speakers are Mr. Tomasz Sporny, Mr. Carl Norman Effect, Mr. Jan Frickshek, and Mr. Jan Novotny. May I now hand over to Mr. Sporny, who will lead you through the conference call. Sir, please go ahead. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I have the pleasure of presenting yet another quarter. So if I can uh, ask you to turn attention to page two, uh, where we summarize key highlights of our performance. Uh, at the end of the third quarter, we generated year-to-date profit of 4.2 billion. Uh, <clears throat> the profit increased 6.6% uh, on the year-on-year year on year basis. The net profit so far uh, translates to return on tangible equity, uh, which is nearly 20%, it's 19.8%. So we have a slight increase in the <clears throat> return ratio. Uh, majority of the result is driven by operating income performance, which increased by nearly 5% to a level of 9.5 billion. On the performance uh, uh, of the third quarter, we've also put together an outlook um, <clears throat> for the rest of the calendar year. And currently, we are targeting um, not, only, not only affirming the, the guidance that we provided at the beginning of the year, but we increased um, <clears throat> the targeted net profit to 5.6 billion for the full year. Uh, from balance sheet perspective, our total assets reached 448 billion. This is an increase of nearly 9%. The loan portfolio remains stable. However, if you look at it uh, in more detail, and we will, you see that the lending activity is reinvigorated, and we look with confidence towards the end of the year and towards 2025. The funding base of the bank increased substantially uh, at the rate of 8.6% and reached at the end of the quarter 444 billion. Continuing, continuing on page three, uh, we look at capital and some other uh, important aspects. Um, from capital perspective, uh, we are at 19.2% capital adequacy ratio, which we consider sound and solid. With respect to excess capital, uh, over the OCR, <clears throat> we hold 7.2 billion uh, of surplus uh, capital. If you look at it from perspective of structure of the excess capital, 5.3 billion is against tier one and 1.9 billion uh, is related to tier two. Uh, we've also improved the morale ratio of the bank on standalone basis. Uh, the ratio now stands at 28.1%, and this was uh, accomplished on the basis of morale bond issuance in the amount of 300 million euro. We issued the bond uh, in early September. And lastly, uh, we managed to decrease, or the regulator decreased our pillar two requirement by 30 basis points to a level of 2%. Just from uh, <clears throat> context of uh, longer perspective, uh, before the pandemic, we had 1.9. So this is also, this also normalizes in time. Based on strong uh, recurrent profitability, based on uh, solid capital position uh, and uh, large uh, surplus capital, we've elected to uh, uh, propose uh, three crowns per share, extraordinary dividend, 
which uh, should be decided upon in the upcoming general meeting, which will be held in late November. And if approved, the payout will then uh, be before the end of this year. Turning uh, to macroeconomic environment on page uh, on page five, uh, <clears throat> the economy is improving. However, uh, the growth of the economy is substandard. If you if you look at the GDP growth in uh, relative terms, uh, we've had. Uh, <clears throat> Two quarters of growth are uh, coming from uh, negative territory in the in the third quarter of 2000 of 2023. The projection for this year is overall growth of 1.1 percent, which is probably a bridge too far. But we will we will uh, certainly see at the end of at the end of at the end of the year. From perspective of uh, Czech Republic's uh, indebtedness, the ratio is relatively stable at 43.4, and the state budget deficit for this year is projected at 282 billion uh, billion crowns. Currently, the deficit is at, as at the end of uh, September stands at 182 billion. Uh, for the next year, uh, the Czech Parliament uh, just approved the main, let's say, constraints of uh, the public finance, and the deficit should be at the level of 241 billion uh, in 2025. And we continue to enjoy uh, low, low unemployment, which obviously is good for. Uh, uh, for our business. Turning to page six, we look at inflation and interest rates. Inflation has been coming down, the reported number, 3.5% uh, at the end of uh, September. The full year should come in at the level of 2.6% for uh, 2024. On the basis of declining inflation, uh, the central bank uh, cut the rates uh, seven times, um, and currently the key rate stands at 425 basis points. And you can see uh, the impact of the cuts on short uh, uh, short end of the yield curve in the in the graph below. Nonetheless, uh, <clears throat> the governor of Czech National Bank warned. Uh, that there are at least two factors that might impact uh, further cuts. One is being the absolute and relative size of the deficit, and second, uh, evolution of uh, inflation within uh, the segment of services and the uh, price increases there uh, seem to seem to continue throughout uh, throughout the current year. Now, how are we performing against the market? So uh, we provide you with a brief view on page seven. This is our performance against the deposit market, where Moneta produced growth of 7.1% against the market growth of 5.6%. Uh, I would call this broadly with the market, with a slight overperformance in retail. Uh, and lagging, somewhat lagging in the commercial deposit segment, but this is uh, mostly due to our pricing policy and conscientious uh, tactical decisions we've taken during the past uh, past three quarters. Turning page to the lending market, uh, currently we are underperforming the lending market. We grew. 50 basis points against the market performance of 4.6%. This is mainly attributable to our performance in 2023, where we really drove through the year uh, with a foot uh, with a foot on brakes. Nonetheless, when we look at the performance uh, year to date later on in the presentation, you see that we have uh, reinvigorated the lending growth and we look with confidence towards the year end and particularly towards 2025. 
Now let me <clears throat> let me go into the uh, operating platform of the bank, uh, starting with the overall view. Uh, we currently have uh, uh, the uh, customer base of 1.6 million rounded up. Uh, the customer base continues to grow, albeit at a slower pace. Uh, the pace of growth is 2%. This is obviously connected uh, to the interest rate environment and to the cuts that we have done on the deposit gathering price cuts on the deposit gathering side of our business. Branch network, we have 134 outlets. What is perhaps more important than the 12 month evolution is that we've elected uh, to close 11 outlets this year. Uh, this will be accomplished by the end of the year and it will help us uh, to manage the cost base of the bank. And it's also a reaction as you will see later on evolution of the branch, uh, of the branch traffic and utilization. We continue to share ATM infrastructure with three other banks. So we have a very strong position in terms of ATM footprint throughout the country. With respect to the employment of uh, the bank, it is stable. Uh, here you can clearly see that uh, on the front line we have slightly less people and we have taken on more people into namely enabling functions. Uh, this is due to the digitization of the bank and higher demand uh, for people uh, within, uh, uh, within management of the digital uh, of the digital platforms that we operate. And uh, uh, this is natural when you look at the digital on page uh, 11. Uh, if you look at it from customer perspective, registered into the digital channels, uh, this is nearly 1.5 million with a very solid growth of 8%. If you were to dissect this number, uh, into growth of users in the key platform, which is the mobile banking platform we operate. The growth there is 13% of registrations. Uh, the digital channels have become the primary channel, uh, how the bank and customers interact with each other. On uh, average day, we have 676,000 visits and the growth here uh, is fairly <clears throat> is fairly strong at more than uh, 13%. But perhaps more importantly, uh, where we experience the biggest growth is on servicing transactions. Uh, nearly 17 million transactions to, uh, since the beginning of this year. And this constitutes uh, a very high growth of more than 25%. And this obviously takes away traffic uh, from both branches and uh, our contact center, and you will see that on the following following pages. Uh, additionally, we have relatively good growth in sales. <coughs> relatively good growth in uh, <coughs> sales transactions uh, and very uh, solid growth in loan applications and in payments as well. Now, turning page to the branch network, uh, we see fairly robust decline in branch visits, nearly 15%, 1.2 million visits year to date. So if you put it in the context of the digital channels, it's actually quite interesting uh, from, that, uh, from that perspective. We are trimming down the staff at the branches. And you can see that the biggest impact that we have, and this is due to the uh, shared infrastructure on ATMs, is a very uh, strong uh, decrease of cash transactions. This is deposits withdrawals at the, at the branch level. Uh, solid uh, growth in, on the other hand, we have still solid growth in loan applications within the brick and mortar network uh, and usage, uh, well, the usage of the branch network is about one third uh, of our customer visits uses it. Nonetheless, again, the usage of the network is declining 
by a robust 10%. Uh, turning page to page <coughs> 13. In the contact center, if you look at the inbound traffic, this testifies both the inbound traffic and the email communication uh, that the traffic is declining. And uh, this is as a result of the success of the digital channels. Again, we are trimming down the staff somewhat uh, and client service level uh, is satisfactory even though we run the contact center in order to have slightly, uh, let's say to have constrained capacity in order uh, to convince our customers to use to use self care in the in the digital channels on insurance we have again uh, fairly good uh, performance and solid growth on this dimension of the of the contact center then if we turn page this is the last one on the uh, on the operating platform page fourteen. The ATM network, the biggest accomplishment of this year uh, is that we have shared deposit uh, facility with two banks, it's Comerchny and Airbank, with the third bank, Unicredit, uh, will come online uh, during 2025, but having more than 40% market share in the deposit machines helps us to transfer uh, the deposit flows from the branches into the deposit ATMs. If you look at the ATM infrastructure, withdrawals are declining uh, overall, and the deposits are growing at a robust rate of uh, more than 20, uh, 20%. And again, uh, even the ATM network has lower traffic of service transactions as the digital channels are uh, taking that away. And with that in mind, I guess uh, the most important message here is that we are on track with respect to the guidance, with the performance across all of the major lines, uh, <clears throat> generating profit of 4.2 billion and being confident that we can reach 5.6 billion net profit for the calendar year 2024. And apart from that, uh, we will uh, initiate shareholder distribution in the amount of three crowns per share, subject to approval. This shareholder distribution will not impact the 2024 dividend, which we accrue at 90%. And now uh, my colleague, Jan Fritschek, will walk you through the details of the PNL. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm on page 16, and it's my pleasure to walk you through the profit and loss development section. <clears throat> Let me repeat the key financials. This year, Moneta delivered net profit of 4.2 billion so far, which represents earnings per share of 8.3 crowns and return on tangible equity of 19.8%. Operating income of uh, nine and a half billion crowns is up by 4.6% year on year. And this was mainly achieved through the 14.5% growth in net fee and commission income. On the cost base, uh, we report a broadly stable balance year on year of 4.2 billion, which represents cost to income ratio of 44%. On the cost of risk line, we incurred net cost of 351 million, corresponding to 18 basis points of the average loan portfolio. And this is nearly at the midpoint of our original guided range, 10 to 30 basis points. So altogether, net profit of 4.2 billion is up by 6.6% year on year. And as such a strong uh, profitability enabled us to increase the minimum guidance on the net profit by 400 million to 5.6 billion, as mentioned before. Moving forward on page 17, we provide the detail to the net interest income development, uh, which is up by nearly 5% year on year. And you can see that the improvement further accelerated in the third quarter, which is up by 9.2% against the second quarter. This also resulted in the net interest margin improvement 
294 basis points in the third quarter. Drivers of the growth are explained on the right side, starting with the lending interest income being up by 4.5% year on year, supported by loan portfolio yield up by 20 basis points. Treasury income decreased by 21% year on year, which reflects, the, uh, which reflects uh, declining two-week repo rate. However, almost uh, all uh, missing uh, treasury income was offset through lower cost of funding stemming from our uh, repricing effort on the deposit side. Moving forward, on page 18, net fee and commission income development in the third quarter, we show we we uh, achieved a growth of 10.6% uh, year on year, predominantly due to improved performance in distribution wealth management products, which you can see in the top right corner. And I will provide more detail on page 19. Firstly, the outstanding amount of distributed wealth management products expanded year on year by 63.2%. And this great expansion was delivered on a basis of 17.2 billion of uh, volumes distributed this year, which is by 118% more than the volume distributed last year. Such a significant balance year, such a significant outstanding amount expansion together with increased uh, opening fee resulted in a commission income growth by 122% or 282 million year on year, which you can see in the bottom left chart. On page 20, we provide uh, more detail uh, to the uh, distribution of uh, insurance products. First of all, this year, we generated uh, commission income from this franchise of 900 million, which is almost the same result as delivered last year. However, I have to point out that last year, the result was greatly supported by the extraordinary bonus of 267 million. If adjusted for that, recurrent income increased by 19% year on year. And this was achieved through improved performance in distribution of all insurance products in our offer, which you can see uh, in the numbers on the right side. On page 21, we can continue with the net income from financial operations being up by 4.5% year on year. Uh, the growth was achieved uh, predominantly due to better margin on client FX conversions together with uh, the uh, extraordinary gain on bond sale, which is higher this year against the last year. On the other hand, the result was partially impacted by a lower result on derivatives. Um, and on page 22, we complete this section with the OPEX. As mentioned before, cost base remained broadly stable of $22 billion. What is important, three out of four categories are reporting declining trend. Uh, the most pronounced is visible on regulatory charges, being down by $91 million year on year. On the other hand, personal costs increased by 6.3%, which was mostly driven by higher sales incentives this year, reflecting improved performance in the sales force, and also higher or increased average salaries um, amid uh, persisting inflation on labor market. However, I would like to point out that uh, personal costs incurred this year are nearly at the same level as uh, reported uh, uh, for the comparable period of 2022, where the uh, compound annual growth rate over the last two years stood at uh, 60 basis points only. This almost zero inflation was achieved through the 10% reduction in the number of FTEs, which we realized in the first half of 2023. So with that, let me hand over to my colleague Jan Novotny. Thank you. Thank you, Jan, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I have a pleasure to walk you through the next section of today's presentation, which is the balance sheet development section. I'm starting on the page number 24, where we are showing the key highlights for the Q3 2024. And let me comment first on the top left chart. We have successfully returned our lending portfolio to growth. On year-on-year -year comparison, it is plus 0.5% growth. However, the growth from the beginning of this year is already more than 2.8%. 
Moving to the top right chart, the funding base is also a very solid growth, up by 8.6% year on year, and 6.9% for the last three quarters, including the successful issuance of mineral bonds in a value of 300 million euros. The two bottom charts are showing the key highlights from the pricing perspective, showing stable loan portfolio yield at 4.9% and significantly reduced cost of funds to the level of 2.7 for the Q3 2024. Now let me continue with more in-depth view. On the page number 25, we are showing the development of the overall balance sheet of Moneta Group. We have ended up with a level, a level of 488.2 billion Czech crowns as of the end of Q3, with year-on-year -year growth of 8.7%. We are also showing the composition of both sides of the balance sheet with its respective growth rates. On the next page, page 26, we provide more details on the success we drive on the lending growth. We are more than 43% up on the total new volume production compared with the same period of the last year, and we are reaching 42.5 billion check rounds of new volume disbursement so far. On the right side of the slide is the split to retail and commercial volume with a very robust growth across all the categories with more than positive outlook regarding the further growth in Q4 this year, as already mentioned by Mr. Spurney. Now, moving to the next slide, slide number 27. Here you can see the evolution of our lending portfolio and it's split into the three segments we are serving, being it retail, small business and SMEs, and its corresponding growth rates. If you look closer to the retail growth, which is on the slide number 28, you can notice that the growth story begins to be visible from Q1 this year, especially in the consumer loan portfolio, as well as in auto loans. Also, the mortgage portfolio starts to grow again as we see current market potential to increase the production while keeping superior profitability. The only category which is not growing is a small credit card and overdraft portfolio. However, this corresponds with the market size and its contraction over the past few years. On the next page, we have prepared a similar split for the commercial portfolio, where we have successfully managed to grow across board, except for year-on-year -year view on working capital category. However, this was influenced by a few larger repayments at the end of 2023. Now, moving to the yield section, on the page 30, it's clearly visible that we have managed the loan portfolio yield to stay at the same level of 4.9% for the past few quarters. Retail portfolio yield has slightly increased in Q3 and commercial went slightly down, both by roughly 0.1%. Maybe what's worth to mention regarding the commercial is that we kept almost the same yield despite the fact that there is a material portion of commercial loans on the private based float rate. So that was the part about the loan portfolio its yield. And now let's move to the deposit overview section, starting on the page number 31. As mentioned already, we're still keeping very strong growth. However, it is visible that the growth is slowing down due to continuous private rate decrease and therefore also customer rate decrease, which, shows down, which slows down the customer appetite to keep the cash on the saving products. We can also see the respective growth in all segments with retail maintaining its dominant position. Now, talking about the repricing effort, please let me move to page number 32, which is showing the evolution of the overall balance and our funding cost repricing effort results. We are now more than 100 basis points below the Q1 level, and this trend is expected to continue into Q4. What is also remarkable is the fact that we have managed at the same time to increase our funding base by almost 6%. Now, on the next page, page number 33, we are showing the evolution of the retail customer deposits split into current account balances and the saving term and other deposits. All the categories grew up in a strong pace and the overall balance stood at 322.7 billion check rounds at the end of September this year. On the page 34, you can see the same split for the commercial deposit product, which are mirroring the results in retail, except for the current account, which is again driven by a change of balance of a few bigger deposit customers at the end of Q3 2023. Last component of the deposit balance, the wholesale funding, is in more detail on the slide number 35. Overall level of wholesale funding has reached 22.6 billion check rounds, mainly due to already several times mentioned successful mail board issuance of a total value of, total value of 300 million euros and nominally small decrease of the due to the banks and other categories. Now, please let me move to the last slide of the balance sheet section, which is the page number 36, showing the composition of the overall cost of funds into specific categories. 
The key is the overall decrease from 3.6 to 2.7 percent in last two quarters, driven by both retail and commercial customer deposit, which, as you saw already, supported the improvement of the net interest income for the whole monetary group. So that was the last slide for this section. Thank you very much for your attention. And please, me, please let me hand over to our chief risk officer and vice chairman of the board of directors, Norman Fecht, to walk you through the next chapter of today's presentation. Thank you, Jan. I will continue with the liquidity section. So, apologize well, yes, for, <laughs> uh, apologize for, for small uh, confusement. Uh, I'm on page 38. In a nutshell, Liquidity position uh, during the third quarter uh, remained uh, strong and robust, which is demonstrated across all key liquidity metrics. Loan to deposit ratio decreased to 64%, and uh, share of high quality liquid assets on customer deposits increased to 43%. Below that, the regulatory metrics uh, report a significant surplus over the 100% regulatory limit namely liquidity coverage ratio being at 340% and the net stable funding ratio being at 178%. On page 39, we report the development of our high quality liquid assets. Um, you can see the growth rate year on year 28.5% and 14.6% uh, achieved since the beginning of the year. Uh, these high quality liquid assets provided a significant support to our net interest income over the last uh, eight quarters. Not surprisingly, the spread over the cost of uh, funds narrowed down since the beginning of the year, uh, reflecting uh, two week record decline. However, in the third quarter, we managed <clears throat> to, uh, to recover part of the lost margin through the repricing of the deposit base. With that, let me proceed to the capital section, starting on page 41. First of all, key metrics on, uh, on uh, the consolidated level, where we reported 19.2 uh, capital adequacy against the management target of 15%. This uh, excess represents uh, 7.2 billion in absolute amount, which is visible in the bottom right corner and the composition was already <clears throat> mentioned, 5.3 billion excess on tier one capital level and 1.9 billion excess on uh, tier two level. On the right, the chart in the bottom, on, uh, sorry, on the left, the chart on the bottom left uh, shows and it clearly shows that the extraordinary dividend of 1.5 billion would be paid on top of the regular annual dividend, which we continue to accrue at 90% of uh, consolidated net profit. On page 42, we provide further detail to the capital level, to the capital position on consolidated level. The position in absolute <coughs> amount uh, stood at 33.3 billion, uh, mostly stable since the beginning of the year. And the chart with excess capital development in the bottom right corner shows that at the end of September, Moneta maintained uh, available capital of 11 billion, which is a sum of uh, 7.2 billion excess and uh, 3.8 billion dividend accrual. So altogether, this corresponds to 22 crowns per share. And we complete this section on page 43 with the capital position on the individual level. As mentioned before, the MREL issuance uh, resulted in the overall position expansion to 46.9 billion reported at the end of September. And also MREL adequacy ratio increased to 28.1% against the management target of nearly 22%. So as you can see, Moneta maintained robust capital positions on both levels, and this enabled us to propose an extraordinary dividend and also to continue with the dividend accrual at 90% of the consolidated profit. With that, let me hand over to Norman, our Chief Risk Officer. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Jan, and uh, good morning to you. We are now at page 45 with an overview of key risk performance metrics. Let me start on the top left of the page. 
So cost of risk came in at 18 basis points, which is well within the provided guidance of 10 to 30 basis points, which we published earlier this year. When you look at the loan loss provision coverage and the total NPL coverage, here the values um, ended up at a level of 1.62% and 112% respectively. The drop of these coverages were largely driven by NPL sales, which we conducted in the reporting period, upgrades of previously forborn receivables, and also partial releases of the ECL management overlays we conducted throughout the first nine months of this year. And as regards the MPL ratio, this remained flat compared to the end of last year and stood at a level of 1.4%. Moving to page 46, here we have a more detailed overview of how cost of risk evolved in the first nine months. Um, if you look at the absolute amount of cost of risk which we incurred in Q3, this amounted to 114 million Czech crowns, out of which uh, uh, retail contributed 167 million book up and 53 million release in commercial. The, uh, the retail book up of 167 million was also impacted by some management overlay we created for the flood which occurred in the Czech Republic at the end of uh, September, and also we increased some um, uh, the increased the coverages for the insolvency portfolio for our retail portfolio. In commercial, the release of 53 million was impacted uh, largely by a macro update which we conducted in August um, this year. If we continue to page 47, here we have five data points each of the development of the loan portfolio MPL balances. Uh, loan loss allowances and coverages. Let me again start on the top left. Um, the uh, portfolio actually grew by 7 billion since the end of last year. At the same time, loan loss provisions dropped by around 230 million uh, since the end of uh, 23. If you just look at the stock of provisions of 4.5 uh, billion, we still have management overlays of uh, 450 million. They remained largely unchanged to the second quarter. We will conduct uh, another review in the course of November and assess to which extent any adjustments on the ECL overlays have to be uh, conducted. And uh, as far as the loan loss provision coverage, as I mentioned this before, 112% and 1.62%, and the MPL uh, ratio uh, has been flat throughout the year, uh, standing at 1.4%. And the stock of uh, MPL uh, was, by coincidence, identical to the stock which we had at the end of June this year. Continuing um, on page 48 here, we have the overview of MPL in and outflows since September 23. If you just look uh, to the right side, uh, to the third quarter, we essentially had a zero net MPL formation in the reporting period. Uh, and this was largely due, uh, due to the MPL sales we conducted in the third quarter, write-offs, and also a fairly solid cure rate performance of the portfolio. And the last page of the risk section, page 49, here we have the evolution of delinquency ratios across the three buckets, 30, 60, 90 days past due. As is clearly visible, they remained uh, flat already for uh, an extended period of time and still remain well below pre-COVID levels. So summarizing the, the risk section, I would say the key takeaways are the following. One, uh, we have seen a solid core performance on cost of risk within the guidance. Two, uh, the third quarter was positively impacted by NPL sales. Until the end of September, we have conducted uh, debt sales uh, in excess of 700 million realizing a pre-tax gain of more than 90 million. In the month of October, we conducted another fairly large debt sale uh, of 300 million with a 33 million gain. This brings the total uh, amount of debt sales until today uh, to a billion Czech crowns. Um, now on the back of these developments, uh, meaning the solid core performance and the above expectation on the debt sales, we have updated the targeted, targeted result on the cost of risk. 
and see it to come in in a range of 15 to 20 basis points instead of the initial 10 to 30 basis points uh, uh, guidance we provided early in the year. Obviously, all this assuming that no major external adverse developments occur or there would be any commercial, larger commercial default. And with that, I hand over back to Thomas Bonny. I would like uh, to comment on <clears throat> current outlook for the year, which is set forth on page 51. Um, <clears throat> we would like to accomplish operating income at level of 12.8 billion. Uh, you can see that uh, the upside uh, against the original guidance is 400 million. Uh, coincidentally, this is the highest level of operating income that we've accomplished uh, since the IPO in 2016. So uh, the good news uh, that we would like to get across is that uh, typically we were outperforming the cost of risk. And now uh, <clears throat> we are coming to, uh, let's say, core growth of operating income being the chief cause uh, of the uh, better than expected performance. On operating expenses, we have upside of 100 million against the February guidance. So we would like to land at uh, 5.7 billion crowns on the operating, on the operating expenses. Uh, <clears throat> we've also tightened the range uh, for cost of risk, and we have to see how the year will uh, will turn out. Uh, therefore, we are targeting 5.6 billion crowns net profit, uh, where the equal is stronger than the higher than. Um, and uh, if if we are able to accomplish the 5.6, this was this would constitute 11 crowns earnings per share um, and a return on tangible equity at a level of 19.5%. Uh, if then uh, I can provide a brief comment on page 52. If you look at 2025, um, <clears throat> we will, uh, in 25, we are expecting to absorb uh, to absorb the mandatory uh, minimum reserve issue. The Czech National Bank increased the reserves from 2% to 4%, and this is non-interest bearing. Henceforth, uh, uh, in 25, we face a setback in the operating income in the amount of 250 million, and we will seek to absorb it into the numbers without uh, <clears throat> changing the 5.3 billion minimum target for net profit for 2025. And we are currently studying uh, whether we will be in position actually to increase that target of 5.3 uh, to a different level, but we will be able to communicate that uh, soonest in uh, early February or late February, actually. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I would like to thank, thank my colleagues for solid and entertaining presentations. And now, if we can go to Q&A. So, thank you. If you would like to ask a question, please press star followed by one on your telephone keypads if you have joined us on the phone lines. And if you have joined us on Zoom, you can type your question in the Q&A box provided. And you can also use the raise hand function on your screen. Before speaking, please make sure that your device is unmuted locally. Once your question is answered, please cancel the raise hand function. And if you have joined via the phone, I do remind you that is star followed by one. We'll pause here whilst questions are registered. We have the first written question, which we have three questions. And the first one is, thank you for your presentation. Despite strong new lending momentum this year, net loans didn't grow in 3Q. 
which partly seems to be related to your cautious stance on mortgages. How do you anticipate net loan growth in Q4-24 and into 2025? Well, it has two assumptions. First is stable balances, as we've faced some repayments. Uh, we have, from this vantage point, a temporary setback. So if we accomplish stable balances and maintain the current growth, um, we will accomplish we will accomplish growth and uh, <clears throat> this is also related the third element of that if you look at our uh, October performance it is actually stronger than September performance namely with respect to mortgages where we have uh, <clears throat> so far this year the highest off balance sheet uh, commitment item it's a 2.7 billion, and if we look at the mortgage pipeline, uh, we command a pipeline of uh, around 8 billion, which is the highest level since 2022. On commercial, uh, we have pipeline of about uh, 800 transactions, uh, which constitute volume of 9 billion. Of course, not all of this will be converted. However, uh, looking at the pipeline, it is strongest in last 24 months, I dare to say. And the fourth element is underwriting or origination, which doesn't, uh, which doesn't uh, <clears throat> immediately flow into the balance sheet. At an enterprise level, the difference between uh, volume put on books and originated volume at the end of the third quarter constituted more than 10 billion. So uh, the 10 billion are in commitments that the bank has made towards clients and uh, it remains to be seen when these commitments will be, uh, uh, will be drawn. So we have factual evidence, uh, let's say leading um, in the direction of optimism rather than other direction. Thank you. And question two, you've achieved notable relief in funding costs through deposit repricing efforts. Given the current interest rate trend and competitive landscape, how much further improvement do you foresee in the coming quarters from here? We see some marginal improvement. We will react uh, to additional rate cuts uh, if Geneva decides to uh, to do them, and for our competitive reasons, we don't want to com comment on this. If you look at our behavior throughout the year, we postponed uh, the rate cuts into the end of second quarter, and we carried them out in the summer. Uh, so we were actually quite nervous whether we would be able to meet uh, our commitments with respect to the internal plan. Uh, we have a plan how to approach it for the remaining of the year. What is, I, I would suppose, the most important is we promised to decrease the cost of funding. We did so, uh, number one. Number two, uh, we avoided loss of liquidity in the bank, which is quite important because what we have uh, gained in terms of clients and in terms of volumes in the last two years uh, stayed with the bank, knock on wood. And third element is we need the deposits uh, due to a very strong uh, cross-selling effort into the wealth management. More than 70% of the wealth management sales are funded from the existing deposits of the bank. So if you were to impute that into the numbers, you would see that the growth of the bank is actually significantly stronger uh, than what we, uh, what we show uh, on the balance sheet. Thank you. And question three, looking ahead to 2025, 
How do you view NII considering growth dynamics, ease funding costs, but also the recent changes in reserve requirements? You've successfully navigated previous changes in reserve requirements. Do you see room to mitigate them in this time? Well, as I said when I commented the guidance for 2025, uh, based on what we know today, we will be able uh, to absorb the cost, the regulatory, the additional regulatory cost. And uh, we look with confidence to 2025. Uh, and I don't want to comment beyond that right now. Thank you. We have a question from Ruslan Gadi for the RBI. Thank you for the presentation. Can you please advise on your regulatory funding strategy for 2025? In particular, do you plan to continue rolling the two CZK tier two bonds? The 1st September 2024 call option was already skipped, as I understand. Another is coming in January 2025. Or maybe you see room for another international bond to replace the CZK Tier 2 Debt Plus, also the CZK 1.5 BN SP bond that will lose its MREL eligibility in 2025 December. Thank you. Yeah. I will take this uh, answer, this question. Uh, first of all, uh, we plan to uh, not to call the tier two instrument, uh, which could be called in January 2025. So we will roll over that, predominantly due to price advantage. This uh, the existing instrument provided us against the new issuance. We are also. Uh, projecting a potential small issuance in the second half of uh, 2022 of tier two instrument, but small and have, uh, haven't been decided yet. Thank you. We now have Shane Matthews with White Oak Capital. Thank you for the presentation and congratulations on the results. One question from my end on yields. Why hasn't the commercial loan book yield reduced despite rates cut since it's a floating rate book? How should we think about overall loan yields going forward, i.e. 2025, and impact on NIM? Okay, let me take the answer for this question. I think the key reason is that uh, there is only a part of a portfolio which is on the, on the float rates. The majority of the investment portfolio is in fact fixed. So it will be fixed for till either the refixation or till the end of the of the loan. Also, one of the key important thing is that we grew up, especially in the category with the high uh, margins, being it either a small business or other specific products. So this helped us to keep the same uh, yield throughout uh, this year. Now, going forward, uh, it will certainly uh, sort of slow down or slowly it will go down. This will definitely happen. However, as it's fixed portfolio, it will not happen. Uh, it will not happen too much throughout 2025. Now, on the NIM, uh, now I will comment only from the commercial perspective. I think what helped us, we uh, turn most of our saving accounts, of our deposits, into the float rates too. So, in fact, we are floating significant portion of a deposit based on the priber. The positive is that if the priber is decreased, the day after also the customer rates are decreased by the same level. So, this will help to manage uh, uh, the yield itself. So... Just to maybe add, we improved the repricing ladder on the deposit on the deposit business, namely, namely in uh, commercial where we offer a pribor minus uh, type of uh, type of rates, and the repricing is very quick on the loan book. Uh, I would say that in the fourth quarter we are landing at uh, level of. Uh, 625 plus percent. So the new production on enterprise level uh, comes at uh, two percent margin against the key rate as it stands now, and uh, this is helping the yield to stay 
<clears throat> at the level of 4.9%. 4, 4. This is not the hedge yield, but uh, uh, the, the, the contractual or the effective yield of the portfolio. So, uh, <clears throat> and we are, we have oriented the bank more towards smaller loans. We are doing a lot of uh, uh, fully secured loans uh, through real estate assets at a very good rate. Uh, so we slightly moved the business model um, and in retail and small business. Uh, obviously, the high margin products are growing. Uh, the small business high margin product category is growing at 17% uh, uh, currently year on year. This is the balance growth. And <clears throat> if you look at the uh, growth in consumer unsecured lending since the beginning of the year, it's at 5% level. And there we accomplish uh, effective rate on that category, uh, which is around 8% or close to 8%. So this helps to stabilize the yield. In our outlook for 25, uh, we expect the yield to come down a little bit, but it's a marginal decline. Thank you. As a reminder, if you would like to ask any further questions, you can do so by using the raise hand icon on Zoom. Otherwise, you can type a written question in the Q&A box on Zoom. Otherwise, if you have joined us on the phone lines, you can please press star followed by one on your telephone keypad to enter the queue. Okay, uh, as we don't seem to have additional questions, uh, we would like to thank you for uh, participation on the call. Uh, we'd like to thank for your questions. We hope that we answer them to the ability that, or to the capacity that we have in answering them. Uh, we wish you a nice weekend and we look forward to another conference call which will be held in February 2025. Have a nice day and goodbye. Thank you. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you all for